Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Serial Talker podcast. I'm Peter Von Gom, and today we're going to talk about a murder in Japan. Now, we all know that the crime rates in Japan are very low compared to the rest of the world. Japan has an exceptionally low crime rate and an especially low homicide rate. For comparison's sake, let's take a look at America. In America, for every 100,000 people, there are five homicides. Comparatively, in Japan, there's 0.3. So, in other words, you have a more than 15 times greater chance of being murdered in America than in Japan. When a murder takes place in Japan, they're almost all sensational because they're so seldom. In 2020, murders increased 30% in America. And 40% of that 30% took place in New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Now, I think we can attribute a lot of that increase to the pandemic. Everyone's all cooped up, people getting on each other's last nerve. Powder keg. Everybody just needs to take a chill pill, check yourself before you wreck yourself. In Japan, when there's a murder or any other crime, the police almost always get their man or woman. There's a 99% conviction rate in Japan for crime. 99%. Now, a lot of that is attributed to their extraction methods of getting a confession. The law here entitles the penal system to keep you for 23 days without charge, in which time they can interrogate you day in and day out. And finally, a lot of people just confess, even if they're not guilty. I just need to get some sleep. The Japanese criminal system is built largely on confessions, as opposed to going to a trial and resulting in conviction. So, there's a large percentage of false confessions, which makes our story today even more sensational. It's the murder of an entire family in Tokyo that took place in 2000. And what's most extraordinary, they have never found the killer. This true story comes from crime writer S.A. Osborne on Medium. This is the Setagaya family murders. It's scary enough to think that there are people out there who kill without a thought. Without motive or a grudge, they can easily take a life, no matter how innocent it is. Some killers stake out their targets, while others kill when they see an opportunity. There are those who are meticulous in their planning and leave the crime scene spotless, while others wreak havoc and leave a trail of blood and bodies. This killer is different. The person responsible for killing a family of four in their house while they slept was neither indiscreet and spotless in his murders, nor was he showy. There were no messages on the wall written with blood or dismembering of bodies. But instead, there were ample amounts of DNA, fingerprints, and even clothing left behind that belonged to the killer. Not only did the killer enter the house and travel from room to room, killing everyone in the house, but he also stopped to eat ice cream, surf the internet, take a nap on the couch, and left many clothes behind. He even left a bowel movement without flushing. Why was the killer so relaxed and nonchalant about murdering an entire family. Was this his first crime, or was he so comfortable with killing that he hung out at the house for hours while the bodies around him slowly bled out and went through rigor mortis? This is the case of the Setagaya House family murders that took place in Tokyo in 2000. The killer was able to escape detection and has not been identified. The case still baffles Tokyo police to this day. Find out the details of the crime, and if the police are any closer to finding the culprit 
and solving the case. In Tokyo, Japan, in the Setagaya area, stood a group of houses near Soshigaya Park. This public park was expanding, and the houses were being bought out and demolished to make room for the park expansion. One of these houses that still remained was the home of the Miyazawa family. Living in the house was Mikio, his wife Yasuko, and their children, daughter, eight-year-old Nina, and son, six-year-old Ray. The house sat isolated, with a children's park behind it, where young kids would play, teenagers would skateboard, and people would sit while their kids enjoyed the outdoors. On December 30th, 2000, someone decided to enter this house and kill all its inhabitants. The family had spent the day shopping, enjoying dinner, and watching TV before heading to bed. Sometime later in the night or early hours of the morning, the killer decided to enter the Miyazawa home. It's still not confirmed, but police believe that the killer came from the park, climbed a tree, removed the window screen, and entered the window of the second floor bathroom. Once in the house, he saw six-year-old Ray asleep in his bed. He strangled him in his sleep before moving further into the house. According to reports, Ray's father, Mikio, heard noises and came to check on Ray, only to come face to face with the killer. Despite fighting back, the killer was able to use a long, thin knife, the type used to slice sashimi, and stabbed Mikio several times, including in the head. The attack was so severe that the knife broke off in Mikio's head. Mikio was found at the bottom of the staircase near the front door and had been stabbed multiple times. Further up the stairs on the mezzanine landing, the bodies of Yasuko and daughter Nina were also discovered. The killer had continued to use the broken sashimi knife to savagely kill the mother and daughter. The family was discovered in the morning around 10 a.m., by Yasuko's mother who lived next door and couldn't reach them by phone. The killer had apparently unplugged the phone line. Finding it odd that no one was answering, Yasuko's mother came over and rang the doorbell. When there was no answer, she used the spare key she had and entered to find Mikio dead by the front door. She expressed her horror. In this small house, you were not left with much space to flee if you encountered the perpetrator. They must have been extremely terrified. Police investigators also expressed their shock at the murders, saying he slashed them from above the chest to the face as if he tormented them. It was extremely brutal. And the way he finished them off in the end, it was so horrific we couldn't show those scars to the devastated victims' families. There are no other cases in which the victims have been cut up like this. After police were called, they found ample amounts of evidence the killer had left behind and began their investigation. Here are some of the most shocking things they discovered about the killer and the crime. The killer used Mikio's computer to log on to the internet at 1.18 a.m. after murdering the family. The killer used first aid to mend the wounds he had gotten from the struggle while killing the family. The killer ate four ice cream bars and drank tea. The killer took a nap on the second floor couch. The killer left the murder weapon, a sashimi knife. The killer left fingerprints and other DNA on the weapon and parts of the home. The killer left his hat, scarf, gloves, fanny pack, jacket, and shirt in the house. The killer left his shoes and shoe prints at the house. The killer left an unflushed bowel movement in the toilet, which police examined and found contained string beans and sesame seeds, which was most likely part of his previous meal. And one of the most frightening things, the killer used the internet again around 10 a.m. If this is accurate, then it means that when Yasuko's mother came looking for the family, the killer might still have been in the house, or they might have just missed each other by minutes. 
The police believe the killer left the house in the early morning of December 31st, but don't know the exact time or the path he took. Did he climb back out the window? Did he leave out the front door? Since he left all his belongings and possibly had a change of clothes, the police had no idea how to begin a search. But using what they had, police were able to get a better description of who they were looking for. Despite all the fingerprints, DNA evidence, murder weapon, and many clues as to what the killer might look like, 21 years later, there has been no arrest, no suspects, or positive identification of the killer. However, police were able to use what they found in the house to come closer to finding the identity of the killer. Police believe he was slender. The fanny pack he left had a waist of between 70 and 75 centimeters. Based on his clothes, he was between the ages of 15 and 25 and was about 170 centimeters. His shoes were a Korean shoe, size 28, that is not sold in Japan. Fingerprints showed that he didn't have a criminal record, and DNA blood testing revealed that he was most likely a male, type A blood, and not of Japanese descent. The Korean brand sneakers and DNA showing that the killer might be of Korean descent sent police to search South Korea, but there was no fingerprint match in Korea either. Other evidence, such as soil particles found on shoes and clothing, also were traced to South Korea's Gyeonggi province, making it more possible that there was a Korean connection to the killer. In fact, a famous Japanese investigative writer named Fumiya Ichihashi released a book about the family murders that claims he made contact with a former member of the South Korean military whose fingerprints match those collected by police at the house. However, police investigators claim the writer fabricated the story and repudiate the claims in the book. The knife and some of the clothes found at the scene were bought from Kanagawa Prefecture, and police investigations also found that only 130 of the kind of sweaters the killer was wearing exist. They were able to track down only 12 of the sweaters, though. Takeshi Tsuchida, who was the lead investigator when the murder occurred, continues to work on the case unofficially, even though he is retired. In an interview in 2019, he said, It's been 19 years, and despite so many clues left behind, the fingerprints and the DNA of the criminal, why can't we find him? He also feels regret about the investigation when the murders first happened. When the incident happened, the special investigators at the Tokyo Metropolitan Police were all working on different cases, and it had no choice but to send their reserve team. Also, as it was New Year's Eve, many detectives were at home, and it took time to send the investigators. We can't deny the possibility that this led to an unresolved case. After Tsuchida retired, his replacement, Manabu Ide, continues to keep the case alive. I don't think there is any detective who is not confident, he said. It's our mission to arrest the criminal who murdered four innocent people, including two young children, and make him atone for his crime. The Miyazawas were a normal, loving, happy family. Mikio worked for a foreign-affiliated marketing company and was a fan of anime and theater. His wife Yasuko worked from home as a cram school teacher. Nina was a smart and active girl who loved ballet and piano lessons. Rei was in kindergarten and had a mental disability requiring special needs. He was obsessed with dinosaurs. The kid's grandmother, Mikio's mother, shared her memories of her grandchildren. Nina loved to show me her moves. She was just a bright and adorable child. I always wonder how they would have grown up. My biggest regret is that I never got to see them grow up. Their grandmother was so traumatized by the ordeal that she can't recall the family's funeral. She still wonders why the killer would commit such a brutal act. Why would they kill the children as well, 
she pondered. If someone held grudges, they could just kill the adults. I just don't understand why. I really don't. It has been over 20 years since the family was murdered, and despite the thousands of tips, calls, and over 280,000 police working on the case over the years, the killer still remains at large. The house still stands by the park, a constant reminder of the awful crime that took the lives of an innocent family. Though police have acquired all the evidence they need for their case, the house has not been torn down because relatives of the family want to keep the memory of the family alive until the killer is caught and the family can finally be at peace. Police have offered to pay 20 million yen, 167,000 US dollars, as a reward to anyone who provides key information leading to the murderer's arrest. Ooh, that was a heavy one. This case, of course, is still ongoing and will not be closed until they find the killer. It has had such an impact that it became a cause celeb for abolishing the statute of limitations, which in fact happened in 2010. The investigation has continued to expand. There's a large number of police detectives that are assigned to this case still. After 20 years, they've expanded the search to the Philippines. It seems that the knife that was used in the killings, the handle was wrapped with a cloth in a particular way that's similar to how knife handles are wrapped during religious rituals in the northern part of the Philippines. Now, the Japanese police department has reached out to the Philippine police for cooperation in this investigation, and they have yet to identify clues that would link them to the killer. The investigation into the murders is among one of the largest in Japanese history and has involved nearly 250,000 investigators and collected more than 13,000 pieces of evidence. Every year, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department makes an annual pilgrimage to the Miyazawa home for memorial services. To this day, there are still 35 officers assigned to this case full-time. How sad and how bizarre. The police have determined that the killer has no criminal record because all the fingerprints and other clues that this guy left behind don't match anything in their database. I mean, he left his clothes, he took all of his clothes off, he left a deuce in the toilet, took a nap on their couch, opened up their fridge, took out some ice cream bars, and he ate four of them? They said the guy was slender. There were all kinds of careless clues that the killer left behind. So obviously this guy does not have much experience in the genre of crime. The other bit that really creeps me out is the age profile. They said somewhere between 15 and late 20s, based on stuff that they found in his fanny pack, the type of markers that he had, like school kids use. And when you consider that this guy gained access to the house by climbing a tree and going through a second floor window, he had to be pretty young, or at least in shape, to do that. Now, I'm no armchair detective. But the fact that the killer brought a sashimi knife, it's called a sashimi bocho, and it's a long, thin knife, is a pretty good indication that he had planned this out. Because you don't walk around with a sashimi knife. They're typically made of a high-carbon steel, and it's not something that you can just stick in the waistband of your pants. That is truly disturbing. Let's hope that this killer slips up and they're able to apprehend him and bring him to justice for the family's sake, for the sake of the police that have been working tirelessly on this for more than 20 years, and for the safety of the community. Thanks very much for joining the Serial Talker podcast, and thank you, S.A. Osborne, for your great writing on this story. If you'd like to check out more of S.A. Osborne's work, you can find links to his socials in the description. To help support this program, please consider buying me a cup of coffee. Those details are also in the description. 
And if you have an engaging true story you would like to submit to me to consider reading, that email is also in the description. Thanks always, guys. We will catch you on the next Serial Talker podcast. Ciao.